Well, Jen, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Oh, just, you know, removing body parts and <laughs> getting <laughs> injections and <laughs> crying a lot. <laughs> Last we spoke, you were a week away from getting the double mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And actually, you didn't even have the date at that time. You just knew you were getting a call uh, at any point. So tell us a little bit about that week between when we last spoke and when you got that call. Um, I mean, it was incredible because, you know, I had struggled so much waiting for the call, waiting uh, almost three months, waiting for the call, and then... I got it, and, and and they just said, like, it's a week out. So it was just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's happening. It's happening right now. And so I called my mom right away, and I said, it's happening. I took it. Like, if you can get out here, um, come out, take care of me. If you can't, we'll figure it out. But I have to take this date. Like, I cannot push this any further. But it was just a lot of, like, wrapping stuff up and, like, okay, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Basically, you've sort of been approved at that point, right? And Mm -hmm. you're waiting to be scheduled. But what does, like, approved mean? You have to go through um, an evaluation and be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. So it's just this long questionnaire. It takes several hours just to make sure that that you have gender dysphoria. And um, then it's really just consultations and making sure you're ready and getting blood work and then you're on the list and you're waiting for your surgeon to become available. And and tell me a little bit about what the actual experience was like um, as far as the surgery itself goes. Had to get up really early, couldn't eat, so I was grumpy about that. <laughs> it was like four in the morning and I'm starving. And we head into the hospital and they check me in and everything really went very fast. I think I was in surgery for three hours, and um, I just remember I was so scared. And I'm just sitting there in my gown and in this awful looking, with that little cap, mm. right? Like a shower cap, but I look ridiculous, and I'm just kind of sitting there by myself, just really nervous and very tearful, and you know, because I've never had surgery um, of any kind, so I just didn't know what to expect, and th- th- all these doctors are coming in, and explaining things to me and nurses, and it's all just very normal for them. And I'm like, my life is changing right now. (laughs) Everything's changing. My mom was with me and they said, okay, you know, I think they said something like, your team is ready for you. And I was just like, okay, my team. The doctor came in to give me what he called my margarita mix of drugs. And so they start wheeling me back and I just like look up at my mom and I'm I'm getting super tearful. And they start wheeling me, and I'm, like, saying goodbye to her. And then all of a sudden, the margarita mix kicked in. I was like, oh, well, this isn't going to be so bad. (laughs) Next thing I remember, the nurse is like, Jen, Jen. And I was, it was, everything was done. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, okay, so I was out. I was out. If I had a nickel for every blackout story after a margarita mix, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where I ended up waking up in a hospital with a nurse above me. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same thing. They had so, so much bandaging on me. It didn't feel any different. So I didn't feel like a sense of relief or anything like, oh my God, it's done because everything hurt and there's so much bandaging that when I looked down, it looked exactly the same. And, and just so we know the audience is on the same page with us, explain to us exactly what uh, the surgery you had was and um, and sort of what follow-up medical procedures there are involved. So double mastectomy, so they basically cut like a football hole in my skin, removed the tissue, and then brought the two pieces together or or folded it down so that I have a scar. I have two scars from under my arm all the way to the middle of my chest and here. Um, And and then there's the nipple graft because they have to take off the nipple, reshape it, and then uh, sew it back on. Mm-hmm. So really, that's the most complicated part because you're hoping, because the nipple has been removed from your body, that the body will take it again. 
And that's all done in one procedure, meaning they do the cut, put the nipple back on, and then you're recuperating from there. Like, that's all done in that first. Yes. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so really, the 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 tissue removal and the the skin being pulled down and stitched together is not that big of a deal. Like, that's pretty standard. It's really the nipples. That's what you're worried about. And then they have to stitch on, like, it looks almost... Almost looks like a little like garlic bulb. <laughs> I'm serious. You were saying the toughest part is is uh, well, you were saying that, that the toughest part is putting the nipple back on after they've made the initial yeah. incision, essentially. Yeah, and hoping that the body will take it. Right. So you have that stitched onto you as well as all the stitching um, to keep you all closed up. And how long before you? can remove your bandages. That was actually only a week. It was the longest week of my <laughs> life, but yeah, it was only a week and then you go and you get everything removed and then you see if the if the nipples are alive. So and what was that how, well, what was that that uh, visit like for you? I mean It was one of the best days of my life. It was one of the best days of my life when they took the bandages off and because part of it was I wasn't expecting, like I looked up because it was still really tender. So I was looking up and I could feel some things and other parts were numb as they were removing the tape. And I thought that there was more that they were gonna remove. And then all of a sudden I looked down and there was my chest. So I wasn't really expecting it. I thought there was gonna be more bandages and I just never, I never ever thought that I would have the opportunity to see my body the way that I've always thought that it should be. And I was just stunned, mm. you know? I, I couldn't have asked for a better surgeon, a better experience, and I just felt so grateful that I'm able to do this and, and have the support to do it, but one of the best days of my life, mm. for sure. And then at that point, what was the next step for you? It was really clear. Once the bandages were removed and I just remember looking at myself in the mirror, you know, topless and going, oh, I, I have more. Hmm. More needs to be done. Like, I'm definitely 100% a trans man. Like, not non-binary trans, not gender fluid, not gender neutral, which nothing wrong with that. Sure. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, but it was so clear I'm a trans man and that I want to be viewed in the world as a man. So then at that point when you felt like things were clear, what's the next move there? It was really easy for me. I just had to go to my therapist who uh, is at Kaiser, which is where I got all my... Um, work done and I just said I'm I want to start testosterone and they put an addendum in in my letter that's basically saying that I have gender dysphoria and and he said it's going to happen really fast cuz I thought I was going to have to wait and the my doctor was like it's going to happen really fast so literally I leave his office I'm waiting for the Uber to come get me cuz I can't drive yet mm. and I get a call saying oh we you know we like to make an appointment for you for an endocrinologist. Can you come in in like two days? And I was like, uh, mm, how about in a couple weeks? Because <laughs> it was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this, that, okay. Yeah, that was fast. That was really fast. And I made an appointment for December 31st. And again, I thought, I thought this is just gonna be a consultation. I can just get some information. And I have a great endocrinologist and she's just like, yeah, so, you can just go upstairs, get your blood work, and then go downstairs and get your shot. And I looked at her and I was like, now? <laughs> She's like, mm-hmm. I'll go now and do that. She's like, if you want to. I'm like, okay, 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 we're doing this. Come on, mm -hmm. come on. <laughs> and it just happened really, really fast. What are the, how quickly do the effects kick in and, and tell us a little bit about what those effects are? Um, results, I guess, is a better term. Well, the effects, it gives me a lot of kind of anxious body energy. Um, 
So like, I just want to go run at two in the morning and I have been known to now lift weights at two in the morning because there's nothing else for me to do. So that was the first thing is I just felt like I was on so much caffeine. Um, I just want to run everywhere or wrestle bears or just anything. And that was, that's the first thing I noticed. Then there was just a little bit of body changes and I felt my voice within the first couple weeks not not drop to where it was noticeable, but it's sitting different. It's mm. I can feel it in my chest. It resonates a little bit different. Um, so that's exciting. And then, you know, I started to get some sideburns, which I had to shave off. I'm very sad about, but they're coming back. I have six chin hairs, and I'm very excited. So tell me a little bit about how life is any different or maybe it's not different. Most people don't know, you know, just casually. And again, I'm not, I don't pass yet. So it's still lots of ma'ams and young lady or something like that, which is great because they think I'm way younger than I, I am. See how they feel when I have a full beard <laughs> <laughs> and my chest hair is like <laughs> popping out of my shirt. Oh, <laughs> life goals. Um, but no, it hasn't really changed. I've had some wonderful experiences with businesses that um, like the gym that I go to is is a very small gym. It's the Y. Um, and and I asked the manager how they feel about uh, that I'm trans and what to do about the bathrooms. And that has been a big thing for me with businesses of going in and talking to the managers and say, this is what's happening for me. And I wanna know that I'm safe to use the bathroom or that you're aware mm -hmm. that this is happening. What's your policy on it? Because a lot of people don't know and it's still that the, the gendered restrooms are a big deal and it's really scary at any stage of the process to know where you can go and where you can be safe and where other people feel comfortable with the facilities that you're using. So that's been a big thing is outing myself ahead of time um, so that there's awareness and then I can create some more allies in now you know my story and you can help keep me safe if there's any problems. And the reaction's been pretty accommodating and Amazing, pretty... amazing. Like, I cannot believe how people are willing to not just be supportive, but go go the extra mile to, I don't know, accommodate just doesn't feel like the right word, but really be supportive. Really, because I feel like there's a difference between just like, oh yeah, I'm cool with it, and then actively changing your policies or actively saying, I'm going to go to other managers, or you know what, we don't have a policy. Come to me next week and we'll talk about what we can do. Mm. So that is incredible to me. And it's just, I think the big thing that I'm, that I'm wanting to do in this next step is create more allies, because I feel like we have a small community and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but if people don't know our stories, then they can't help us. They can't be supportive. And there's a lot of stuff going on politically right now that is very, very, very scary for our community. But we need more allies. So we need more people that aren't in the community, that know, that understand, that are in positions of power. Again, even if it's a manager at a very small YMCA that can say, wow, I've never dealt with this let me think of how I want to be sensitive to it and right. then actually do that. So that's been my big quest lately is creating as many allies outside of the community that I can. Has there been any uh, kickback resistance? Yeah, I mean, when I released our video, part one, there was definitely some people on there that were saying, really hateful stuff and stuff that just didn't quite make sense. Or a lot of the things that I've been getting are like, I'm, I don't support you. I'm so broken hearted. Like I thought you were so beautiful. Like I, I'm, I was miserable and suicidal. So would that make you feel better if I was just not around? But I'll still be pretty. But I'll still be pretty. You'll still have these videos of me looking pretty and feminine, but I am a miserable person and I'm miserable to myself and everybody else around me, but I'm sorry you're brokenhearted about that. 
but that I don't look the way that you want me to look. And yeah, some other just, but you know, the thing, the thing is, with those comments, I've been getting nasty comments since the first videos I ever did, you know, eight years ago about my looks, about anything. So it's like, you know what, I'd rather get nasty comments about me doing exactly what I wanna do than me getting nasty comments and looking very pretty and safe and feminine and feeling miserable. Mm. So that's a better way for me to rationalize it of like, I wasn't happy there and I was getting nasty comments and now I'm, I'm standing up for myself and I'm getting nasty comments, but I'm standing up for myself. I'm right. living the life that I want to live now, so. How much do you think that social media, uh, in your case, uh, influenced your decisions along the way? It was less about the social media aspect and more about the career that I've built off of doing videos, you know, for the past eight years. But that was my biggest fear is will I work? Will I... I was afraid that who I was inherently was not good enough. That it had to be some external factor. It had to be the way that I looked, the way that I talked, that just my personality, just the way I presented, just my passion for teaching and learning and helping people wasn't enough. So that if I, my voice dropped and I grew a beard, that I wouldn't be enough. And that's been the big thing for me after surgery and with all this stuff is looking at the fact that my entire life has been built around that I've never felt good enough. Mm. And I've had to address that and I'm going through a ton of therapy to work through that, knowing that if that core is not dealt with, it doesn't matter if I have a flat chest and facial hair because I still won't feel good enough. And and how do you feel like, like, how are you grappling with that now, post-surgery? It's still very new. I, it's funny because, you know, with this, I feel like I have a chance to live again. I feel like I have a second chance at life that not hardly anybody gets. But along with the process of basically going through puberty and learning about my body and what it's doing. I'm having to learn about my brain and, and basically reparent myself and say, I, I can choose a different way to think about myself. I can choose a different way to present myself in the world. I can choose a different way to talk to myself about myself. But it's hard because it's all new. And I think about that like with playing guitar of like, you can learn a couple chords. It doesn't mean you're going to sound good. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting these tools from the support of therapy and a wonderful 12-step group and just friends and family, but it's all very new. And it, it doesn't, it hasn't sunk in as this is who I am. This is now how I treat myself. But it's like, wait, I'll oh, I can be, maybe I can be nice to myself. I don't know, oh, that feels weird, but I kind of want to do it, but I don't know, oh, this is scary. So it's it, everything that's happening with me physically and mentally and spiritually is just this little tiny baby that doesn't quite know what's going on. I know that's how you think of me in I was going to say, so I knew nothing's it. changed. I knew it, I knew it. I saw that stupid <laughs> smile huh. on your face. <laughs> Huh. Well, I can relate to everything you've gone through. You know, with my new glasses, it's like a whole, <laughs> like a whole new life. You know, because I feel like I've been rebirthed, and I, you know, <laughs> I went through a lot. It was like an hour Why? that they did the exam. And for that hour, I was like, "What's gonna? Ha who am I now?" I know you've been on sort of a quest to, in a way, find yourself or find who you know you've always been in the first place, but. As you've been on that journey, have you sort of discovered other things uh, along the way about who you are or who you aren't? I've discovered so much, but it's hard to distill it. I, th I think I've, part of what I've discovered is I'm a nice person. And I think through all of what I've gone through, understanding that 
this was brave. And the, the choices I've made in my life, even to come out to Los Angeles from Colorado to pursue music, to put myself out there, to come out at 15, to do these videos, to transition, to do it publicly, I'm a lot braver than I thought that I was. Because I always really pictured myself as a very scared child that couldn't do anything, that couldn't accomplish anything, that was not making any kind of an impact. And I realized that that's not true. And it's hard to take in to say, you know, I think that was a brave thing. I think that took guts. But that's, when I look at it, it's like, oh my gosh, I, this was not easy and I'm facing it. Mm. Is there anything that you would say to someone who is considering the surgery or is considering doing these type of, you know, bigger changes in their life as they figure out who they are? I would say you're not alone. There are so many people that feel this way, that act on it or don't act on it, get surgery, don't, do testosterone, no testosterone, identify as this, that, or the other. Like, whatever you are, you are not alone. You can find people that feel the same way that you do. And as far as like a, like a slap of reality, I would just say go slow. Go really slow and know that there's a chance that a lot of um, mental damage has been done from hiding and from the way society views this right now. So you have to take care of yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually. But there's more to do because when you hide that long, there's lots of dark corners, you know, in your closet and in your room that need to be explored. And so get help.